Welcome everybody to this European Society of Anesthesiologists webinar on perioperative hypothermia. I'm very grateful and proud to announce that the webinar is sponsored by an unrestricted educational grant from 3M and is accredited for one CME point. So please, at the end of the seminar, don't forget to complete the assessment and evaluation to earn your certificate. Allowing our patients to become hypothermic can have devastating impact on our patients' outcomes. And yet, recent studies have shown that up to 50% of our patients actually still have inadvertent perioperative hypothermia. And this is despite national and international guidelines that have been written and designed to educate us all uh, as perioperative physicians in how to avoid this phenomenon. So, I'm very excited to be here today and act as your host. My name is John Andreofsky. I work as a consultant anaesthetist in the north of England. And there on the little map in front of you, you can, I've drawn a line to join up all the other specialists that I'm really pleased to have with me in the studio today. Uh, namely, um, Prof. Anselm Brower from the University of Göttingen, Prof. Matthias Menzel from Wolfsburg in Germany, and we've also got additional help from Professor Jan Hooker from Neumünster in Germany. Um, Prof. Hooker is going to talk to us shortly about some physiology, and then he's going to disappear behind the scenes because he's our social media expert, and he'll be fielding some questions from you, the fifth uh, and most important member of our team here today. And I'd like to really encourage you to press the orange button that's on your screen and please ask us questions. Uh, Jan will field the questions and send them through to us to try and answer them the best that we can. So I'm just going to start a little bit of the, the, the start of the webinar by telling you a little bit about thermoregulatory thresholds. Our body is an incredible, uh, incredibly good at maintaining normothermia. We have sensors in our skin, in our brain, in our spinal cord, and even in our deep tissues that at all times are maintaining our core temperature between about 36.5 and 37.5 degrees centigrade. And you can see there on the left-hand side of your screen that the um, inter-threshold range is very, very closely controlled. If we start to get cold, then first of all, we change our behavior. Uh, we start to uh, put extra clothes on. And then if we get colder, we start to vasoconstrict. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with your fingers getting very cold and, and almost some of you out there may even have Raynaud's disease. That is the body's uh, vasoconstriction and desperately trying to maintain core temperature. If the temperature drops even further, then obviously shivering commences. And likewise, if the body gets warm, then the first defense we have is, is to shed some of our clothing perhaps, and then the body starts to sweat. And finally, of course, it vasodilates. Compare this now with the next slide, which is what happens when we anesthetize our patients. You can see there that our inter-threshold range has now changed. Uh, the upper range hasn't changed too much, but look what's happened to the lower range. It's way down at 35 and a half degrees C. This means that we don't now vasoconstrict until we're much, much colder than before. And this is what happens to our patients intraoperatively. And this little schematic here shows the, the little man on the left is, uh, is, uh, is everybody here in this room, all, all my experts here with me. We've all maintaining our core temperature at around 37 degrees C. But if you were to put a sensor in our periphery, we'd find that our arms and our legs were actually colder between 31 and 35 degrees centigrade. Compare this to a patient who's anesthetized now. His core temperature has decreased to 36 degrees centigrade. The mass of heat in the body hasn't changed, though. What's happened here is that the patient's vasodilated, and the core temperature has redistributed, and now it's all in the periphery, which, as you'll see, has warmed up there to 33 to 36 degrees C. If we measure temperature interoperatively, which I hope most of us do, you, you'll be familiar with this triphasic hypothermic drop during general anesthetics. This redistribution that occurs in the first hour is very, very difficult to, present, to, to prevent and is due to that redistribution that I've just shown you. The next hour or so is where heat loss uh, continues and is greater than the actual production of heat by the body. And finally, if as an anaesthetist we do nothing to prevent it, our patient's temperature will plateau out at about 35 degrees centigrade. So for the next few slides, I'd like to pass the baton to, to Jan, who's going to tell us about the consequences of an inadvertent hypothermia and why we should try so hard to avoid it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, John. Uh, indeed, there are several serious consequences of inadvertent perioperative hypothermia. Among those are an increased risk for surgical site infections. Coagulopathy is another risk. That means impaired blood coagulation leading to increased blood loss and also requirement for transfusion. It is a prolonged action of anesthetic drugs, not only muscle relaxants, but also opioids and even propofol. And is a, it is also an increased myocardial morbidity. Uh, unexpected myocardial events, myocardial ischemia, for example. And it is this what we know from all our patients at PECU, a feeling of discomfort, shivering, and as a result, a prolongation of recovery times. I would like to introduce this study of Andrea Kurz and co-workers published in New England Journal of Medicine several years ago. And the group plan to investigate 400 patients undergoing elective colorectal surgery, divided into two groups with a different warming regimen. On the one hand, there was a standard group uh, receiving only passive indulation. On the other hand, there was a warmed group receiving a forced air warming plus infusion warming procedure. The outcome parameters of this study were the post-operative wound infection rate within 14 days post-operatively, as well as start of feeding and duration of hospital stay. At the end of the operative period, the patients in the non-warm group had a temperature of 34.7 degrees Celsius, whereas in the warm group, body temperature at end of operation was 36.6 degrees. So uh, quite a big difference. In the end, the study was stopped after 200 patients because of these results. The authors showed that in the normal thermic warmed group, the infection rate was only 6%, whereas in the hypothermic non-warmed group, the rate of post-operative wound infection was three times higher, 19%. And all other parameters observed in this study, asepsis scores, days to first solid food, and days of hospitalization at all were also significantly different. Why does hypothermia lead to wound infections? There are three main aspects. First, there's an activation of thermoregulatory vasoconstriction leading to a reduced tissue perfusion and also a reduced tissue oxygenation. Second, there's an impaired granulocyte function and also, third, uh, an impairment of a lymphocyte function leading to a reduced angiogenesis and also a decreased activation of fibroblasts. And all of the three mechanisms together, they lead to an increased rate for wound infections. Another big problem of hypothermia is coagulopathy. It is not only the platelet function that is impaired, but also clot formation by inhibition of coagulation factors. And the problem is that we do not detect this uh, problem intraoperatively because our standard tests, they are not able because they are performed at 37 degrees Celsius. So we have to keep in mind these factor. I would like to show you a meta-analysis of Raya Gopalan and co-workers performed in 2028, including 14 studies regarding blood loss and 10 studies regarding transfusion requirement in normal thermic versus hypothermic patients. And it is important to know that the mean temperature difference between those groups was only less than one degree, only a small difference. And you can see it even in these forest plots on the left hand for blood loss, on the right hand for transfusion requirement, that there's a big advantage for the normal thermic group. And to say it in words or in numbers, the mean blood loss in hypothermic patients, and this study was 16% higher, and the relative risk for transfusion in these patients was even 22% higher. Another problem that we have is a problem of prolonged drug action. 
And as I said, not only you know, with respect to muscle relaxants, but also to opioids and even to propofol. So we have to be sensibilized for this problem. We have to take care about it and we have to take care about it into our monitoring. Frank and co-workers performed a study about two different warming regimen between uh, non-warmed and only passively insulated patients undergoing a routine care management on the one hand and actively warm patients with a forced air warming procedure on the other hand. And they looked at catecholamine and cortisol levels as well as on hemodynamic parameters. And the results were that the norepinephrine levels and also the mean arterial blood pressures in the hypothermic group were significantly higher. And all this explain a possible mechanism for the increased cardiovascular morbidity we observe in our hypothermic patients. So John, I give back to you now and I will leave the studio going to the back office and mm. I hope you will press the orange button and uh, actively ask. Mm. Thank Thanks, you. Jan. So what about the influencing factors? Why do our patients get uh, cold in theatres? Well, it's fairly obvious that the colder the environment is, the more cold the patient's going to be. So people quote a temperature of about 21 degrees C is where we should be aiming to keep our theatre temperature. The surgery, needless to say, a, a prolonged surgical time, particularly if, if warming isn't efficient, will lead to a colder patient. And finally, of course, major surgery uh, makes your patient more at risk of getting uh, hypothermic. In terms of body morphology, um, it makes sense that patients with more insulation aren't going to get as cold as those who have a low body mass index and they are particularly at high risk of uh, inadvertent hypothermia. And ASA and age, both ASA and age have a, a trend as they increase to, to lead to patients getting more and more cold. Having said that, these type of patients, when they do get cold, they're the consequence of hypothermia are perhaps even more serious for, for, for an older patient with a high ASA. Now, this is the study I put up here on the left-hand side is a study with over 50,000 patients carried out by Sun and his colleagues in the United States. And the fascinating thing here for us is that these patients were warmed interoperatively. And you can see there that at just under an hour, nearly, well, just over 60% of patients are cold despite being warmed interoperatively. Every patient undergoing spinal or general anaesthetic is at risk of hypothermia. So it's not just the high risk cases that we talked about before, the major surgery and the ones lasting two or three hours that we need to be worried about. We should be looking after all our patients. And with that in mind, I'm going to pass the baton on to, to Matthias and ask him to talk about an interesting case that he's uh, done recently. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Um, yes, um, I would like to present a case from my hospital in Wolfsburg. Um, a case, we introduced a spinal anesthesia for the surgical procedure. And I would like to convince you and to demonstrate that also in your extra anesthesia, Temperature management to prevent uh, inadvertent hypothermia is very necessary and needed. So, the case, a 78-year-old female patient. The patient um, experienced a traumatic hip fracture and the planned procedure was a hip atroplasty. The woman had a body mass index of 21 only and the ASA status was 3 and you can see the lady came with some significant comorbidity. So how does it work in our hospital? If the patient arrives in the induction room, the induction room is closely related to the OR suite, we first start pre-warming in our patients. And after starting pre-warming, we apply our routine monitoring and we apply one method of monitoring body core temperature in even awake patients. In this case, we used a zero heat flux thermometer. After that, we establish IV access and finally, we install spinal anesthesia. So John, now I would like to give over first poll. Thank you. Exciting times. This is the first poll and it's your chance to take part at home. So we want to know before we go on and find out a little bit more about pre-warming, this is the first time we've mentioned it in the webinar. 
How often are you guys warming your patients uh, in, your, in your anesthetic practice? So you can see you've got five options there, A, B, C, D, or E. So if you never pre-warm your patients, please press never. If you pre-warm less than 25% of the time, press B. Uh, C, if you warm between 25 and 50% of the time. 50 to 75%, pre please press D. And if you warm almost all your patients, over 75% of them, then please press E. So I'm just going to leave that to poll up there to give you all a chance to press the correct buttons. And Matthias, we're going to go on and find out a little bit more about pre-warming. How does it work? What's going on in the body? Uh, are we just warming up our patients? Are we just increasing their core temperature? Or, or is there something else going on? Thanks. Well, John, um, to answer these questions, let me first refer back to a slide you already showed us, the phenomenon of redistribution. Um, actually, if we speaking about pre-warming, we try to prevent the phenomenon of redistribution. In our patients, after inducing anesthesia, you already showed us, vasoconstriction is impaired and the ability of thermoregulation is impaired as well. And this fits also for patients with neuroaxial anesthesia because the lower part of the body has any more vasoconstrictive um, potency. So if redistribution, redistribution is at risk, pre-warming is actually not increasing the body core temperature, but pre-warming is effectively increasing the temperature of the periphery of our patients. And so preventing the phenomenon of redistribution hypothermia by inducing anesthesia to our patients. So in this respect, pre-warming is not treating hypothermia, it is an effective measure of preventing hypothermia in our patients. Of course, during the period of pre-warming in awake patients, for example, there is not hypothermia already in place. But to achieve the protective effect of pre-warming, you have to involve an active warming system that maintains a surface temperature in our patients well above normal core body temperature for the entire pre-warming period. And to make that clear at this point, warmed hospital blankets, cotton blankets, from a warming cabinet in the channeling in area are not considered to be an active pre-warming method. The effectiveness of pre-warming, what pre-warming alone can achieve, was shown in a patient study done by Horn at colleagues in 2012. And in this patient study, colleagues compared patients without any warming therapy, the blue line, the lower line, with a group of patients that received pre-warming in different lengths of time from 10 to 30 minutes. And as you can see, the difference between pre-warming and no warming was statistically significant. And what the graph also indicates that even a, a short period of only 10 minutes of pre-warming was sufficient to have in these patients a completely different temperature curve without uh, reaching hypothermic levels. So this study is clearly demonstrating the effectiveness of pre-warming. So time for next poll, mm. John. So we've got the answers uh, to, our, to our polls. I don't know if you can Aye. see them there at home, um, but I can read them out to you. So I'm very, I'm kind of, uh, oh, here we are. There are the answers there. So you can see that 40% of our respondents say that they never pre-warm their patients. And it's fantastic to see that 10% of patients are warming over 75% of their patients. So that's really good. And there's various results in the middle. But I would think we'd probably all agree that the majority of anaesthetists seem to be either never or only warming 25% of their patients. So there's a little bit of room for maneuver there. I've started using pre-warming in my own practice and the patients really enjoy having the pre-warming put on. They, they say that they feel cozy. Their anxiety levels seem to drop. So, Matthias, why do you think it's taking the anaesthetic community so long to warm to pre-warming? Yes, thank you, John. To be honest, John, 
That is one of the unanswered questions. It's some kind of a miracle to me why it is so difficult to convince our community to establish pre-warming as a routine measure in our patients. From my perspective and experience, if you start up with pre-warming, you should do it in a structured way. You should set up a specific protocol for using pre-warming in every patient. So if you do this, you are sticking with the national guidelines, for example, the German guidelines. And that is my recommendation to our many colleagues that have said we pre-warm, but not every patient. Uh, if you start with pre-warming, do it in a routine way and set up a protocol for all of them. And if you set up protocol for pre-warming, then make sure that you select a pre-warming solution that is compatible with the surgical procedure afterwards. Then you can easily use the equipment of pre-warming for the intraoperative active warming also. And if you do pre-warming starting in awake patients, select the highest temperature setting on the warming unit and you can then adjust the warming uh, amount to the patient's tolerance and patients will experience additional warming comfort as John uh, already said. And the last message, even 10 minutes of pre-warming are usually sufficient to at least achieve an initial effect. Sometimes I am told that, and his colleagues tell me, Yes, we would like to introduce any pre-warming in our procedures, but we have not an anesthesia induction room and we have not a holding area, so we cannot perform pre-warming. And that is not true. We have only, we are missing ideas sometimes. And if you really check the process in your hospital, you can do pre-warming on the normal ward starting. You can do it in a holding area. Of course, you can do it in the anesthesia induction room perfectly well. But even if you have none of these spots available for your access, you can do it during induction on the OR table in the OR suite. Usually it takes at least 10 to 15 minutes to accomplish anesthesia maneuvers and you can use this time for pre-warming even in the OR. So if you if we go back to my case, uh, we used pre-warming in the spinal anesthesia setup with an upper body blanket placed lengthwise on our patient. And the patient, as you can see, is covered with a warmed cotton blanket from a warming cabinet. But to make that clear, the warming blanket, the cotton blanket is not for pre-warming, it's just for covering the uh, forced air warming blanket on the top of the patient. Anyway, in our patient, after doing all this, we experienced a temperature drop to 35.8 degrees Celsius at the point of skin incision. So if you perform pre-warming, as we did in our patient, of course, you go ahead with warming during the operation period. And if you usually use the same method as you use for pre-warming. In our patient case, we used forced air warming. But to make that clear at this point, it is not the only method you can apply forced air warming for pre-warming and intraoperative warming. There are other methods available, conductive methods with different devices you can perfectly well implement in the process, especially for pre-warming, but also for intraoperative warming. Uh, it depends on the availability of the methods um, for your hospital. So, John, now the next time Thank for questions. Thank you questions. very much. <coughs> it's time for our second poll. And as you can see there, Matthias is going to cover something about fluid infusion warming. But before he does that, I want you all to have a chance to vote again. Uh, this time we want to know how often you use infusion warming in your patients. So if you never use it, please press A. If you use infusion warming in about 25% of your patients or less, please press B. It's C if it's between 25 and 50% of your patients. D, 50 to 75%. And if you use fluid infusion warming in almost all your patients, please press E. Anecdotally, there's a, there's a massive difference in the UK of the way uh, my colleagues and anaesthetists in the UK seem to use fluid warming. Um, 
So whilst we wait for the vote to come in, Matthias, just tell us a little bit more about the difference between the different types of warming and perhaps a little bit more about fluid warming in your own practice. Thanks. Well, John, um, if you go to the guidelines, the guidelines are pretty clear. If you have an infusion volume expected to be more than 500 milliliter of volume, then you should consider to start with inline infusion warming to avoid further loss of warming capacity in your patients. And from the practical point of view, very often more than 500 to 1000 milliliter of, of volume are given in our daily patient routine. So from this point of view, probably almost all of our patients should have some kind of infusion warming. In our case, actually, we have applied in total 1,500 milliliter of fluids during 90 minutes. So why is infusion warming an intriguing uh, question? Because infusion warming, inline infusion warming, is compared to all our efforts for the temperature management, relatively expensive. So an inline infusion warming technology usually is more expensive than even the blanket we use for active forced air warming. Moreover, we consider inline infusion warming not as a kind of active warming therapy. It is a preventive measure of avoiding further heat dilution. Mm. So many of our colleagues are not really convinced to adopt a way of infusion warming uh, in, in patients with less than one to two, two liters of volume replacement. But the guidelines are strict and our experience is strict and we know from the literature and the research that uh, one liter of added volume on room temperature is probably decreasing the body core temperature of 0.2 degrees Celsius in our patients. And 0.2 degrees Celsius um, reduction in body core temperature, in addition to redistribution and to all other mechanisms, can make a difference. So we have to decide to be very aggressive with infusion warming. And there is one study I would like to show you at the end that shows we have to have ideas and there may be ways to to find different solutions depending on the setup in our hospital. That is one study actually performed by John and his colleagues 10 years ago. And in John's hospital, there is a warming cabinet and they put all the infusion bottles in the warming cabinet, the saline solution bottles. And if they apply it to the patient, it's on a temperature of roughly about 38 degrees Celsius. So the, these guys they performed a study. They compared three groups, one group with standard care, with, uh, with infusion on room temperature, one group with infusion inline warming, and one group with the warmed up infusion from the warming cabinet. And the graph will show you in detail that just this simple measure of the warming cabinet for the infusion bottles really makes a difference, a statistical difference to room air temperature infusion and provided, pre prevented patients to become hypothermic. So my last uh, recommendation and wish is let's find ways for infusion warming to have a better temperature management in our patients. Thank you, John. Thank you. So um, I think the poll results are back. I've got them on my screen in front of me. <clears throat> I'm waiting for them to appear. There they are. So how often do you use fluid infusing warming, infusion warming in your own patients? Well, 8% of anaesthetists are never using fluid warming. So a little bit of room for improvement there. And when combined with B, you can see that there's quite a large percentage of, of anaesthetists not warming the majority of their patients. But I'm very pleased to see that there are, again, a, a kind of a big cohort are using it over 50% of the time and over 23% are using it in the majority of their patients. I think that's a much more even spread than we saw with pre-warming. And I think this probably reflects the fact that... Um, the pre-warming guidelines has been out for a while now, and I think uh, pre so, sorry, the fluid warming has it's been there for a while, hasn't it? But pre-warming is a relatively new thing, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll, perhaps if we do this webinar in five years' time, we might see some different results. So it's time there for me to uh, ask some questions to my uh, experts. I've got them here on the screen. Uh, Jan sent them through to me. Uh, and the first one 
uh, is, is something from Konstantinos Lolakos, and he wants to know, uh, does pre-warming have any adverse effects? Yeah, um, if I'm asked to answer this question, pre-warming can have an adverse effect if you pre-warm patients that already have a hyper hyperthermic condition. That's why it is very, very important that you find a way to monitor body core temperature in the induction scenario of your patient. Because if a patient shows up with a body core temperature higher than 37.6 degrees Celsius in my hospital, we would not pre-warm this patient. We would establish core body temperature monitoring and decide later on uh, if we step up with active warming therapy or not. Uh, to my best of knowledge, more, more adverse effect uh, is, me, is not uh, known to me regarding pre-warming our patients. Mm. Maybe, maybe um, Anselm has Anselm. some additional information. Well, I'm also not aware of any real adverse effects. We have a small minority of patients, about 1%, maybe 2%, that at some point in time say, well, it's getting too warm. Mm then we reduce the temperature of the force of yeah. the warming device. Um, and that's it. There are no more adverse mm. events, no more adverse outcomes, because these patients are all awake, so nothing really can happen. Mm. Matthias, are you yes, happy with that? that? Yeah. That's fine with it me. It's interesting. I think I, uh, one of you pointed it out to me when we were preparing this, the fact that I got quite excited because I wondered whether by avoiding uh, vasodilatation, Perhaps we could have a positive impact on avoiding hypotension at induction. Do you know if there's any evidence out there to suggest that? There, there have been, I think, two studies that tried to figure that out, and the answer is no, it does not prevent mm. hypotension after induction of anesthesia. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So uh, there's another uh, question here. Um, uh, and I think we're going to deal with that one later on. So the, there's another one here about the best financial argument in discussion with your chief financial officer if you have to buy more pre-warming equipment. Anselm, do you have any thoughts of how, how we can manage the financial aspect of this? Um, I think there are two answers. First of all, there are guidelines and we should follow these guidelines. It's not our individual idea to warm patients, the guidelines are out and they are based on the best medical evidence that is available mm -hmm. and our health system wants us to treat the patients in the best way we can treat it. So we have to do it. It's not our idea. We have to do mm. this. Mm. The second argument is there are so many adverse outcomes uh, that are associated with hypothermia. And for example, surgical site infections in the States, there was one study that showed superficial uh, surgical site infections cost 11,000 US dollar deep. Uh, surgical site infection cost 25,000 US dollars. So if you can prevent one surgical site infection by your warming therapy, you will save so much money that you can warm a large amount of patients. Mm -hmm. I think we've got time for one more question before we move on. And uh, it's a question uh, regarding uh, pre-warming often being blocked by the surgical nurse because airflow of active warming could affect surgical washing and preparation of the wound area in the manner that antiseptic work can't be granted between anesthesia and surgery isn't established. So active warming is delayed. So the question here is, is there a real hygienic problem by airflow of active warming I guess what this, what this person wants to know is before surgery starts, should we be, is it okay to continue forced forced? The warming? answer is simple, no. There is no risk. No proven risk. Only fear. Fear. Um, I agree completely with Anselm and uh, the message is clear. Uh, I would like to add one more aspect of this discussion. Of course, Temperature management is really addressing from the beginning of anesthesia till arriving the PACU. So many, many 
professional groups are involved of um, of doing temperature management and accepting it. Mm. And of course, surgeons and OR nurses are important members of the team. Mm. And we have to address uh, concerns and uh, we have to address restrictions of them. Yeah. But it's not the way that we say, okay, they don't want it, we don't do it. It is convincing them, yeah. showing them the benefits of having warm patients and and arguing on a on a basis of guidelines on and of literature mm. and from my experience you always can establish a routine that is addressing the the fears and the the needs for temperature management by interrupting warming for a certain period of time as short as possible yeah. but Anselm maybe will refer yeah. to this point i think later we might on. hear a little bit more later on so i'm going to move on uh, because Anselm has got another uh, interesting case about this time about a general anaesthetic, I believe. Yeah, Over thank you very much, thank John. Um, I will present a case of a 50-year-old male patient who had a symptomatic biliary colic. And the planned procedure for this patient is laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The patient is relatively healthy. He's classified as ASA2. And I think it's a normal case uh, with a normal patient. Now, in this case, when the patient arrived in the induction room, he's already covered with a forced air upper body blanket that was put lengthwise on the patient. And as one of the first measures, we are starting pre-warming, the same way as Matthias does. We measure core temperature, in this case, under the tongue. And then afterwards, we go through a process that is called team timeout, but which can also be called surgical checklist. So we check if it's the right patient for the right operation at the same time. Is there written informed consent for anesthesia and surgery there? When did the patient have the last meal? Are there any allergies? And so on. Then we put on our standard monitoring, get IV access, start pre-oxygenation. Oh, sorry. And this is the time that we have for pre-warming in our hospital. So it's about 10 minutes plus minus a little bit. And this time is very, very important and it's also sufficient. And then we're inducing anesthesia. Now I want to stress this pre-warming once again, although Matthias has already said a lot of things about that, because I think pre-warming is extremely effective and extremely important. It does not only reduce this initial drop in core temperature after induction of anesthesia, it also keeps the patients warmer throughout the whole surgical procedure. And that makes it so important. Now, during the induction period of this patient, the patient is further on actively warmed. And we're only interrupting this warming therapy for the transportation from the induction room in the operating room. And during positioning, washing and draping, the patient is further on warmed. There are some clinicians that prefer to stop warming during washing and draping. To the best of my knowledge, there is absolutely no need to do this. However, on the other hand, I think it's not so important if we really stop it for washing and draping, if, if it's only for two or five minutes. The time that really matters is the time from when the patient arrives in the um, induction room until surgery starts. So if you just miss two or five minutes, that's not a problem. During the operation, we were measuring core temperature in the nasopharynx. Warming therapy was carried out with an upper body blanket and in this case without infusion warming. At skin incision, core temperature dropped due to this redistribution of heat dropped to 36.6, and during the operation, core temperature then slowly rose to 36.9 degrees Celsius. If you ask me if there is a difference in the risk of getting hypothermic between open laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the answer is clearly no. There is no difference in the risk to get hypothermic. And there if you ask me why there is no real difference, I think the answer is that we are normally overestimating the heat losses that occur during abdominal or thoracic surgery. Because normally only about 0.5 milliliters per kilogram an hour of water is evaporated. So if you calculate this 
in a heat loss, this would be a little bit more than 20 watts. Now 20 watts is not so much if you consider the normal heat losses that we have from the uncovered skin that are about 180 watts. So if you have a laparoscopic procedure and even if you warm and humidify the gases that you're using for laparoscopy, this may reduce the heat losses from evaporation, but the overall effect is relatively small. He asked me what kind of blanket should I use for active warming therapy during the operative procedure. I think the answer is, in general, please use the largest blanket that is suitable for the operation and cover the largest available surface with it. Because we can clearly see that the amount of heat exchanging area that is covered by a warming blanket has a direct correlation to the change in heat balance. So the larger the area is that you are covering, the larger will be the change in heat balance and the better will be the effect of your warming device. So in this case, an underbody blanket might be suitable or an upper body blanket. Now, is conductive warming as good as forced air warming or even better? There are some studies out there that clearly show that conductive warming and forced air warming during laparoscopic colored cystectomy are absolutely equally effective. So it works very, very well. However, there are also some studies out that show that during com more complex procedures like complex maxillofacial surgery or thoracic surgery, conductive warming is not as effective as forced air warming. Now, should we have used infusion warming? If you take a look at the guidelines, the answer is clear. Yes, we should have had used infusion warming. In this case, we used 1,000 milliliters of fluids during 90 minutes, so we should have used the infusion warming device. In the PECU, the patient is normothermic. The patient has some thermal discomfort because he's a little bit colder than before induction of anesthesia, and maybe we could have had better condition for the patient if he have, had used infusion warming. But there is no shivering, so no big medical problem in the PACU. Hmm. Thanks, Anselm. So you've all got a chance to vote in the last poll of the uh, webinar now. Um, Anselm's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, thermometry. And uh, in this poll, we want to know how long a procedure would have to be for you to consider measuring your patient's core temperature. So you can see you've got uh, six answers this time. So if you monitor your patients every 30 minutes, please press A. If it's only every 45 minutes, it's B. One hour, please press C. If you monitor for a procedure that's going to last 90 minutes, please press D. If you monitor for, for more prolonged surgery, such as that that's going to last over two hours, then it's E. And if you want to say that you never measure your patient's core temperature, and please press F if that's what you do, because we really want an honest answer, then press F if you never monitor your patient's core temperature. So before, whilst we're waiting for that result, Anselm, give us some more pointers about core temperature measurement, um, where to measure, what's most accurate. And I'm particularly interested in how you suggest we should monitor patients having regional anesthesia. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Well, to put it in a little bit more general perspective, I think there are two reasons or two questions that are important. The first question is, why should we measure core temperature during anesthesia and surgery? And the second one, as you already said, is what, is, what are the appropriate measurement sites and the appropriate measurement methods for the measurement of core temperature? Now, the first question is relatively simple. Why should we measure core temperature? And I think the answer is, well, first of all, we should measure core temperature to detect hypothermia. If you don't look for hypothermia, if you don't measure core temperature, you will never find that your patient is getting hypothermic. And you will never find out how big the problem of hypothermia is in your patients. The second reason is that we should measure core temperature to detect overheating, because overheating can occur in patients undergoing active warming therapy, especially in neonates and small infants. 
Neonates and small infants have a large body surface and have a relatively small volume, so they are losing a lot of heat via that body surface very easily, but they can also gain a lot of heat over that body surface. And you can see on the screen here the data of an observational study where a forced air warming device was tested in neonates and small children. And you can see that about 10 to 20 percent of all of these small children got hyperthermic with a core temperature of more than 38 degrees Celsius, although this was an observational trial and the anesthetist had to write down core temperature every 15 minutes. So it can happen, especially in neonates and small infants. And this is something that we should not do. Warming therapy is more, is not only warming, it's a kind of thermal management and we should also detect overheating. Now, the second question, which measurement sites are accurate enough, is a little bit more difficult. The guidelines say that pulmonary or iliac artery tem blood temperature is very, very accurate. Distal esophageal temperature is ac very accurate. Nasopharynx, sublingual temperature, bladder temperature, forehead temperature, measured with zero heat flux thermometers, are also very accurate. On the other hand, there are some measurement sites that are not accurate enough for perioperative use. These are the infrared air thermometers, the rectal temperature probe, and the auxiliary temperature probes. That sounds so that's a really <coughs> good summary. Uh, just give it half a second for our polls to come back in, so I know the answers are up on my screen. See if we can display <coughs> them for you at home. There we are. How long would a procedure have to be for, for you to measure or to be to bother measuring your patient's core temperature? Um, now, can you see F there? F hasn't appeared on the screen. Uh, F on my screen, we've got 11% of you out there never measure your patient's uh, core temperature. So thank you for all you honest people who tell us, tell us that you never measure your patient's temperature. Um, but it's, it's, it's good to see that there's quite a large percentage of you uh, sticking to what are, I know are the nice, European, nice guidelines which say that we should measure every 30 minutes. And that's certainly what, uh, what we've been uh, recommending here today, that every 30 minutes you measure your patient's core temperature. Um, but somewhere in the middle is where most of you are there. And I have to say, personally, I have to admit to only measuring them every hour. We were discussing this earlier. But uh, having spoken to you guys to, uh, yesterday and today, I think I'll be putting, putting temperature probes in even more of my patients after this webinar. So it's an opportunity for you now to um, ask any more questions um, via Jan. I was expecting Jan to come back in. Jan, are you coming back in? I don't know if you can hear me out there, to find out how many, I think there's been quite a lot of questions uh, from you out there today. Uh, and thank you very much for, for asking those questions. Uh, I'd like to reassure you that if we don't answer all your questions today, we're going to keep a record of them and divide up all the questions between the committee and we will try and endeavor to, to answer all your, um, all your questions individually uh, after the uh, webinar is finished. So you will get a, a response to all your individual uh, questions. So the, 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 the question which I think we were discussing a little bit before the webinar started was one, uh, a septic patient with fever is about to undergo emergency surgery of about three hours duration. Is warming advisable? Anselm, what do you think? My personal opinion is that warming is advisable. Fever in a septic patient plays a role in the fighting of the organism against this infection. So I think we should not interfere with that and we should maintain the temperature of the patient that he has before induction of anesthesia. I don't see any reason why we should let this patient cool down and after the procedure have a patient that is getting awake, freezing, shivering, feeling cold. Um, so therefore, I would recommend keep the temperature at the same range, at the same temperature as he has it before induction of anesthesia. Mm. Thank you. Matthias, I've got another question for you here. Uh, somebody wants to know, should we continue warming in the recovery? Is warming in the recovery just as important as pre-warming? 
A warming in the recovery room is an option. It is part of a complete management of um, avoiding hypothermia, but only in cases patients experience hypothermia. If a patient arrives in the recovery room with a body core temperature well above 36.0 degrees Celsius and he did not experience a prolonged hypothermic period during the surgical process, from my experience, patients have no discomfort that would, um, that would uh, introduce or would uh, push us to, to introduce an active warming therapy. It is about the situation as Anselm has reported, the patient is a little bit, he feels that the temperature is a little bit below mm. his mm. comfort range, but he's not shivering, so we don't use frequently warming therapy in the PECU, but of course, we have it and we do it if there is hypothermia. Perfect. Um, I would I've like got to add a good something. question here, so if you just quickly, yeah. I think pre warming is much more important than post operative yeah. warming because yeah. one is yeah. prevention of hypothermia. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And the second thing is therapy of hypothermia when the thermal management did not work for what reason ever. Yeah. Okay. And prevention is more important. So, Another question which I've got here, which is something dear to my own heart, because I do some very long neurosurgical procedures, and that some of my patients do reach a core temperature of greater than 37 when I'm warming them. And the question here wants to know is, if your patient goes above 37 during long surgery, is it okay to stop the active warming for the next hours, or is it better to go on just reducing the temperature of a warming device? Now, I think it's worth mentioning here that all our warming devices have an ambient setting. Yeah. So perhaps you could... Matthias, maybe tell us a little bit about the ambient setting. Would you ever use it intraoperatively to cool a patient or would you just turn the warmer off? Yes, uh, this is a very good question because if you are in a clinical routine, very experienced, you see that body core temperature is not a static um, situation. It is a dynamic parameter. And after the initial temperature drop caused by redistribution, as we have learned, there are... Uh, a, a quite uh, reasonable proportion of patients who experience a slow temperature increase, of course, driven by our active warming therapy. But if the surgical procedure lasts longer than 90 minutes, two hours, then we have patients steadily increasing body core temperature, even if we stop forced air warming or active warming therapy. That is probably something about the inflammatory regulatory uh, reaction of the, of the body. We have not enough information. But in my hospital, if the patient reaches a level of uh, roughly about 37.4 degrees Celsius, we stop active warming. And if the patient, as I said before, is approaching to the level of 37.8 or even higher, we use the ambient air um, option of our blower to a little bit cool down the patient's surface in this situation. Mm. So I don't know how much more time we've got left, but another interesting question here is one for you, uh, Anselm, because you mentioned underbody blankets. And there's a question here. What's the difference between putting the warming blanket under or on top of the patient? Well, I think the oh, yeah. main difference is that um, underbody blankets are suitable for some operations where there is large area of surgical access. Think of modern uh, endoscopic surgeries where a lot of the body surface is used for the operation itself. Now, in general, warming the back of patients is not so effective because there is very little heat loss from the back and the change in heat balance is very small. But together with the surgical draping, the forced air underbody blankets form a kind of a warming tent. So the warm air moves under these surgical drapings and then um, warming therapy mm -hmm. can be very, very effective. Thanks, Anselm. Jan, this is perfect timing because there's one of these questions which seems to have been written just for you. <coughs> um, so it says, does pre-warming for longer time periods, for example, longer than 45 minutes, which is what I did in my study, I fairly cooked them, prevent better the appearance of hypothermia than shorter time periods? So this is a study, I guess, that from Horn, which I know you're involved with. Could you, because I know we've covered it, but perhaps reiterate just how long we should pre-warm our patients for to be effective. 
Yes, John, I will do so. But before I answer your question, I want to thank the audience. Uh, I stayed outside and we have an overwhelming audience. We have almost 100 questions and more than 600 people uh, in the audience following this uh, webinar. But uh, I'd like to answer your question. Well, we performed a study investigating different pre-warming times in patients. They were from 10 minutes to 30 minutes pre-warming. And what we saw in this study uh, in 200 patients was that there was almost no benefit between 20 minute pre-warming and 30 minute pre-warming. That means the most benefit was at a pre-warming time of, of 10 minutes in contrast to no pre-warming, we could prevent uh, more than 55% of the patients from getting hypothermic, but there was no additional benefit of a pre-warming duration of uh, more than 20 minutes, only a little one. So I think we can't recommend a pre-warming time of 34 minutes or even uh, 45 minutes, like in your advance, uh, like, like in your example. May I add something? Very quickly, because I think we're about to hit the summary. Yeah, I think this is a very important study because if you think of the daily practice, if you would like to pre-warm every patient for 45 or 60 minutes, we would never be able to organize that. And therefore, I think these short periods are so important. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions, but thank you, Jan, for fielding them all. I'm going to summarize now. So I put the uh, five important summary points there for us all. I think uh, we've learned today that inadvertent perioperative hypothermia really is detrimental to patients' outcome. I think the two probably most important consequences are that of uh, perhaps increased blood transfusion due to coagulopathy and to uh, the definite indication that patients get more wound infections if they're allowed to become cold intraoperatively. Secondly, we've learned how important it is to measure your patient's temperature. If you don't measure it, you'll never find out in your own practice how many of your own patients are cold. St I would really urge you all to measure more of your patient's temperature. Then you'll find out in your own practice which of your patients are colder than others. And you can actually, if you, if you, if you find that a lot of patients are cold, then use pre-warming. Use increased intraoperatively warm and continue warming them in recovery if that's, if that's really what's necessary. Intraoperative warming though, we saw from that paper by Sun, is just insufficient to prevent IPH by itself. Up to 60% of our patients will be cold at about an hour if all we do is, is, is warm them intraoperatively. And in order to get more of our patients normothermic, we have to now turn to pre-warming. Um, it's in the German guidelines, it's in the uh, UK NICE guidelines. I've heard that it's gonna be in the, in the Spanish guidelines that are due out soon. And I think more and more guidelines are coming out there and the evidence is overwhelming that pre-warming is probably the only way that we can genuinely prevent inadvertent perioperative hypothermia. And finally, the marginal gains, that even small volumes of unwarmed fluids can help prevent hypothermia. Matthias told us that one liter of fluid at room temperature will decrease your patient's temperature by about 0.2 of a degree C. So that 0.2 make, make a difference between the binary uh, cold patient at 35.9 and that patient uh, warming up to 36.1. So I would urge you all, even giving small volumes of fluid, to use either an inline warmer or if you have access to a cabinet, put your fluid in the cabinet. I would suggest you put it in for between six and eight hours. You do need to label it when the date went in because I think after a month, you probably shouldn't be using that fluid, uh, but warm it in a cabinet, give it fairly quickly and your patients will be warmer as a result of that. So that's my summary of today's, um, today's uh, webinar. So I've got to remind you all now to earn your CME certificate. The way you earn your certificate is to uh, fill in the online assessment. Uh, do the evaluation form, and then you will uh, be sent your CME certificate, and you, they've given you a week or so to actually do this. The deadline is next week on the 5th of March. And it's also my pleasure to announce the next uh, European Society of Anesthesiology uh, webinar, which is going to be on residual neuromuscular paralysis. And I think this ties in a little bit with what we were hearing today, yes. uh, the fact that... Uh, 
hypothermic patients, uh, drugs act for longer, in particular the neuromuscular blockers, and how important it is to measure uh, neuromuscular uh, blocking agents uh, with trainer form monitoring. And you can see there the scientific faculty uh, that's going to be uh, taking you through residual neuromuscular paralysis. And I believe registration for that is now open. So it only remains for me today to say thank you to the backroom staff for facilitating this webinar. Thank you very much to Ansel, Matthias and Jan for joining me here. Uh, and thank you very much to you at home for taking part. The answers, the uh, polls were really, really very well uh, responded to and the questions have really got us thinking. Uh, so thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next webinar. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you.